everyone. Um, I am uh, very pleased to be able to do this lecture. Uh, this is ultrasound basics. Uh, I am a retired physician, and but I manage a school uh, of ultrasound for cardiovascular uh, sonography as well as OBGYN and general sonography. Um, I teach physicians uh, to do ultrasound, especially uh, point of care ultrasound. And so this lecture that I'm going to do today is the ultrasound basics. Some of the information that I will be sharing might be a little bit uh, basic for some of you that are already scanning. And some of it might be a refresher and for some might be totally new. So I hope you take uh, the best out of this. Uh, it was it was created uh, for a physician that doesn't know how to do ultrasound. Uh, this is a very basic nobology and how things work. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. And at the end, we'll have a Q&A. So if you have any questions, we'll go over them. So uh, this is just a show of Tampa Bay, Florida. This is where I live. Uh, it's a very nice uh, town in Florida in the West Coast. So uh, the first part of this course is to give you the knowledge and the confidence to scan all major abdominal organs. So this PowerPoint was created as a guide and a reference point for your scanning uh, journey. So uh, table of content, uh, I'm not gonna go too much of this. I wanna move forward. Uh, I believe um, we might be able to give you this as a PDF. Uh, for you to be able to review later. Um, we'll see. Uh, just a little bit about physics. Um, physics uh, is not something I'm going to go too much into, but I just want to make sure we understand the, the basic concepts, uh, which is basic uh, concept of physics is that uh, the probe is on touching the skin. And of course, we need that gel uh, for the sound wave to be able to penetrate. Uh, we have to keep in mind when we do ultrasound, not so much about everything about physics, but understand that sound waves, as it penetrates the body, it will lose power. It would attenuate. So the deeper you go, the more power you need for that wave to be able to just not even go there, but also come back to the probe. So just keep it in mind whenever we do the adjustment on the nobology on the screen, uh, we have to keep in mind where we are uh, on the body and uh, how much penetration, how much, uh, what kind of frequency we're going to use in order to get the best image. I believe that um, it's important for us to be able to know the verb, uh, the terminology or the verbiage that we use in ultrasound as we express the images. So this is very basic, but we're going to start with the first one, which is, of course, uh, let's see if I go here, is anechoic. So we know that a cyst, to be a true cyst, has to have thin walls, anechoic, and good through transmission. And we can call that a simple cyst. So that's as anechoic. This mass in the uh, kidney is going to be a hyperechoic or echogenic. Uh, compare. So we're comparing the echogenicity or the density of this mass to the rest of the parenchyma of the kidney. The next one over here, this is a typical uh, metastasis uh, into the liver, and that it will be a hyperechoic. So hypo, I'm sorry, hypo meaning darker compared to the surrounding tissue, right? So that's hypoechoic lesions in the liver. Uh, the next one is going to be homogeneous, meaning they are exactly the same texture or ecotexture. And that's one of the things that in ultrasound, we try to make sure that we get the right setting to be able to determine if something is normal in texture or not. As you can see, the next one is going to be isoechoic. And this is the one that sometimes tricks us a little bit just because the mass that you see over here is almost similar to the surrounding parenchyma of the liver. So if we don't have our um, nobology or our, our, our gains properly set, we might actually miss 
this uh, isoechoic mass. And the last one is the reverse as the hypoechoic is gonna be a hyperechoic lesion in the liver. So I hope this uh, kind of help um, make sure that you understand the no, uh, terminology that we use uh, is very important in order to be able to um, dictate. So there's a lot of question about frequencies and um, which probe to use. So we're gonna go a little bit through that, but I, I thought it would be interesting to show you uh, what high frequency, mid and low frequency is. So in this particular um, this uh, drawing, you can see a high frequency. That means there's many um, cycles uh, in the uh, pulse. And if you think about it, that every cycle, that every um, uh, the amplitude or every time you have one of those cycles will be a form of bringing in information. So in this case, this high frequency wave, you can see all the green dots. I mean, that's more information coming to you, which is why high frequency is very uh, good for quality of the image compared to low frequency where you have only two or three of those green dots. So the information is not gonna be as good but the low frequency will be able to penetrate the body a lot further compared to the high frequency, which cannot penetrate very deep. So when you have to pick a, an ultrasound probe, you have to think of what am I penetrating? And I think that's the key word is penetration. So you don't choose an ultrasound probe uh, the ultrasound probe doesn't choose what kind of exam you're doing, is the type of patient, the location of the exam that you're going to do, that is going to choose the probe. In other words, if I'm going to do a leg ultrasound on somebody that is a skinny leg, I will use a high frequency, uh, low penetration probe. But if the leg is very big, I might actually have to go to a low frequency uh, high penetration probe. So the patient's body part will determine what kind of probe you should be using. So the question is always uh, which ultrasound probe uh, to use. And I kind of gave you a little bit of, uh, of an introduction into that. So the most important factor in determining the probe, uh, the proper ultrasound image, to determine the proper ultrasound is choosing the correct ultrasound probe transducer. So there, so before you start scanning, always ask yourself this question, what application am I using it for? How deep are the structure I am trying to visualize and how big or small the footprint do I need? Dr. So, Pena, I, yes. I, I am so sorry to interrupt. Sure. I'm getting a lot of, um messages that the participants are un unable to see your presentation. Um, participants, can you please tell us if you see the presentation, if you could hear him? Okay. Yes, no? Yes, a lot of them can see. Um, so, yeah, I apologize. I'm so sorry. Um, no, but no. please, please proceed. Please proceed. Okay, Kaiba, can we make this presentation available on a PDF for them? Um, yes, if you're willing to, that's not a problem. Okay. Um, I would be happy to, uh, especially if somebody was not able to to watch what I was doing. Um, but this is being recorded, so I, I guess they can go back and look. Okay, so uh, going back to which kind of probe, if we were to look at all the different probes that are available, uh, they try to specialize in different areas of the body. And it gets a little bit confusing. Oh my goodness, there's so many different probes for so many different places. But I think we would be safe to say that these are the three main probes. And with this, you can do almost everything except uh, transcavity, in other words, transrectal or transvaginal, of course, these are not the probes. But otherwise, I think these three probes will be sufficient uh, for you to cover 
uh, the whole uh, area. So uh, one of the things that uh, we can see over here is that we have a linear probe, we have a curvilinear, and we have face array probe. So usually this one is for cardiac, this one is for abdomen OB, this one is for small parts like thyroid, breast, testicles, uh, vascular. Um, so the footprint is the area that is actually touching the patient. So this would be the footprint and you can see how big it is compared to this one, which we actually use for cardiac. Uh, just because we can go between the ribs very nicely. It doesn't mean you cannot use this for abdomen. You can. Uh, it's just the footprint is made and the angle is made for cardiac especially. So the linear probe is a high frequency, about 7 to 14 megahertz. Uh, it's linear and you get this kind of a square uh, image. Again, thyroid, breast, vascular testes, muscle, skeletal, uh, ultrasound. Uh, the next one is the face, face array probe. This is a, also a low, this is a low frequency uh, probe, usually a 3.5 megahertz. It has a narrow footprint. That's why we can go between the ribs. And this is your typical um, long uh, as view, axis view of the left ventricle, mitral valve, uh, left atria, et cetera. Uh, so heart, and of course, we can do abdomen as well because it is a low frequency 3.5. The curvilinear is similar as the linear, except the edges are in a curve, uh, which is also 2.5 megahertz. In other words, low frequency, that's why we're able to penetrate a lot. Deep structure, wide footprint, that's why it's also very good for obstetrical cases. So liver, renal, aorta, spleen, OBGYN. So one of the questions that a lot of new sonographers have issues with is the indicator uh, or the marker on the probe. So each probe will have somehow a little indicator, will have a little nub or something that you can tell that this is the right side of the probe. And as we are going to scan on a sagittal view, transverse view, and even oblique view, we need to keep in mind that the dot should be on the right side. If you turn around, it's on the left side of the screen, uh, but the right side of the patient, right? So it should be on the right side of the patient or cephalic side of the patient. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. If it's on the other side, usually it's for cardiac. So the indicator will go on the other side when we use the face array probe, just because cardiac is uh, scanned reverse. So keep an eye for those little dots. You should see it on whenever you're scanning. So if we look at a sagittal view, and this is the cyphoid will be over here. Those are the rib edges. And this is the view I am getting right now. So this is the uh, part already of the right lobe of the liver. Uh, we have the IBC, one of the splenic vein coming in, and of course the cardiac silhouette or the cardiac areas over here, which means what? It means that we are either scanning uh, uh, longitudinal, cephalic to uh, pedial, or we're gonna go left to right. Of course, we can twist and go a little bit oblique if we want to, but that is basically the probe. So that means that the indicator should be facing the patient, which means the indicator should be on the right side, or in this case, facing the head, the heart being here on the screen. So that would be the head on the image, the head on the patient. We have the feet, uh, anterior and posterior. So that is how your image should be on a sagittal plane. So if we go, and of course, sagittal plane, the heart is over here. This, it happens to be the aorta, is gonna go underneath and go around to the heart, right? I'm gonna go, and again, if I go sa uh, sagittal on the patient, that should be probably the either celiac trunk or the SMA coming out. We have the aorta and we have vertebral bodies in the back, in the posteriorly. And again, bacterial body, we have a cartilage uh, disc right here. 
and almost the tip of bifurcation of the aorta still on sagittal. And here you go, the bifurcation with the common iliacs on both sides. That, of course, that is more of a coronal cut more than a sagittal cut. So going transverse, now the indicator is going to be on the right side of the patient, which means it's on the right side of the screen. So if we can go, of course, side to side, up and down, and a little bit of oblique if we need to. In this particular image, we can see that we are looking at the liver, we're looking at the pancreas, and the splenic vein coming across. Again, the right right to the patient. We have the left side and the left side on the screen, anterior and again, posterior compared to the other that we did. So uh, this is just a couple of images that I had uh, to show you. This is a transverse view, cyphoid looking towards the heart. Uh, one way to easily uh, visualize IVC with the hepatic veins coming into it. Um, vertebral body with the aorta IVC. Um, this is your typical celiac trunk with common hepatic artery, um, uh, um, splenic artery over here, the left lobe of the liver used as a window to be able to seal this. And of course, aorta IVC, portal vein coming in. So this is your typical image that we look for to, as I move down a little bit, I should be able to see pancreas. And there we go. So as I move down, we have the SMA coming out of the aorta, splenic vein coming across, pancreas really nice with the left gastric artery right here and the common bile duct right there. This is a beautiful picture to determine that there's no stone uh, or anything obstructing the common bile duct in the head of the pancreas. So I tell my students that uh, ultrasound is a, uh, a is an exercise in wrist, and that's why I have this flamingo dance over here. They use their their wrist a lot, and that's what we do in ultrasound. Ultrasound is not raising your arm or keeping your arm up; that will kill your deltoid. Uh, what you need is to be able to uh, rotate the wrist. So I usually rest my arm on the patient. And I just use the uh, the uh, the hands, the wrist, to rotate uh, in all this fashion. And you should be able to, with your fingers, to rotate the probe without having too much trouble. Um, so again, holding the probe, I see a lot of people that hold the probe right here. Uh, that does not give you a good, steady hold on the probe. I rest my arm on the patient, and that way it is very, I have very much control. I have a lot of control of the probe, especially when I'm trying to find very detailed information. Um, it is a lot easier to be able to have it this way. So the technique is actually like if you were holding a pencil. Uh, you have a lot of ability as you know how to write uh, with a pencil, um, it would make sense to use the same um, muscles to be able to scan. So now uh, going into the nobology, uh, I put this picture of a cup, uh, uh, a pilot um, cockpit uh, to uh, illustrate that sometimes we look at an ultrasound machine and we say, oh my goodness, where do I start, right? So this, the idea of going through this is these are the steps that we are going to take. Um, of course, powering on the machine, selected the transducer, preset. I'm going to go all through each one of these. Out of those, the one in red that I put, I, I, uh, I'm sorry, adjust depth and adjust gain are probably the two most important ones that you should be able to do right away. So let's go through it and uh, see how that goes. So usually this would be your typical ultrasound screen. They all, uh, um, uh, ultrasound nobology, they pretty much all are uh, similar. In other words, they all have 
more or less the same buttons. And I tell my students that if, for example, you're using you're used to driving a, a 2018 car and now you're going to drive a 2024 car, when you get in, you have to sit down and you have to look to see where is the key or no key or or you know adjust the mirrors. So it takes a little bit of time to get familiar with your new car. The same thing is happening with an ultrasound machine that for the first time you're gonna use. You have to stop and say, okay, where are my buttons? And go through them and then you should be uh, able to go. So let's go through them on this particular machine. First of all, I wanted to talk about depth control. Uh, depth control on the ultrasound machine, if the probe is up here because this is the skin area and we're gonna go through the liver. Once we pass the diaphragm and we see the ribs and we see the shadows of the rib, after this, we're actually scanning the bed and even maybe the floor. In other words, this is all wasted uh, energy for the ultrasound machine. The ultrasound machine has to go all the way down and then come back to give you information. So this is where the physics part comes in. If you eliminate by um, getting the image closer, then the image will be much better, much more accurate because the ultrasound machine now does not have to spend the time going back and forth and can actually spend the time giving you better resolution. Usually the standard is that we'll do about two fingers below the area of interest. So for example, if this is the liver diaphragm, I will do two fingers below the diaphragm and that's as far as I'm gonna go. That allows me to see if there's any pleural effusion, allow me to see if there's any ascites and that should be good. So that should be uh, where we wanna be. In terms of gain control, this is the other one I mentioned that was very important. The gain control uh, is gonna make the difference into making something really dark, perfect image, and something too bright. And uh, as you remember, when we talk about the terminology, the iso, um, isoechoic lesion in the liver can be missed if you are too dark or too bright. And the idea is to have the same homogeneity. In other words, that looks the same from top to bottom. That is the idea, right? So uh, that is something that we need to adjust. So there's two things that I just mentioned that are really critical. It's your depth and is your overall gain. So let's go through it. So you start the machine up and the first thing you're gonna do is that you're gonna choose which transducer you're gonna, or probe, you're gonna use for the exam you're gonna do. So the second thing you're gonna do is if the machine has a preset um, screen. In other words, it will ask you for this particular probe, these are the different kind of exams that you can do. So here you can see the probes on top, an S5, an L9, and a C5. So that's five, uh, five, mega, five uh, megahertz, nine to three megahertz, five megahertz probe. So we chose the five megahertz probe and is asking me which of these presets I wanna take. By clicking on the presets, the machine will automatically set up the package for measurements. So as you take measurements, special for OB, as you take the fetal, uh, uh, femur length uh, and any other, um, any other uh, measurement, it will recalculate, it will calculate the uh, uh, estimated uh, time of delivery of the baby, the weight of the baby, et cetera, et cetera. So the packages are really important for OBGYN, for cardiac, for example. The next thing is like I mentioned, you should be talking, looking at your depth. That means you already put the probe on the patient, you put some gel, you put it on the patient, and now you want to adjust so that the area of interest being pancreas, liver, whatever is that you're concentrating on or the test is all about, you want to make sure that you're big enough and not too little or too much. So the depth button usually will say depth. 
the overall gain usually will be on the 2D or overall gain. But if you see 2D, two dimension, that, uh, that is the one that will control the overall gain. And again, you wanna make it that is homogeneous and that you can see whatever is supposed to be anechoic, like those vessels are really truly anechoic. After that, you can play with a TGC or time gain compensation. And basically this part, it helps you, I call it the Picasso, because this is where you become a little bit artistic. And what you do is, for example, this band that's created on the image, I could actually take those two and move them backwards to make it darker and this band will disappear. So this helps you not do an overall um, brightness or overall darkness. It's just you can now pinpoint where you want to clean up uh, the image. So this is a very good. For example, here is a little bit too dark on the skin sur surface. And so I would move this too to give a little bit more uh, power in order to brighten up the superficial area decrease here to make it a little bit nicer. Focus. So focus will be then the area that you see over here. Some machine will have multiple focus. Uh, I tend to like to just one focal point. The focus serves as two areas two for two reasons. The main one is that you're telling the machine, this is where I want you to concentrate your lateral resolution. Uh, so in physics, lateral resolution is the ability to see two structures next to each other. Uh, so by putting the focal point right here, uh, I'm actually telling the machine, hey, I want you to focus there. So for example, we have a gallbladder, I have a polyp in the gallbladder, I might wanna move the focal point right where the polyp is in order to really look at the polyp and make sure there's nothing else going on there. So that is your focus. You can move it up and down and um, it's, a, it's a good tool to have. Uh, the freeze button, uh, when you scan, you should always have your hand next to the freeze button or you scanning with one and you're holding or next to the freeze button. And the reason is that as you know, patients breathe, things are moving, your hand is moving. So all of a sudden you see a picture that you really want it. Uh, the sooner you can freeze it, the more, the better the chance of you getting the picture. Of course, we have a tool just in case that you miss that perfect picture, like in this one before, by moving the trackball, then you can actually see the image a lot clearer. So the trackball is a system where the machine has stored a previous uh, images right before you froze it. And those images are available just by moving the trackball, right? So this is a great tool um, if you missed an image and you can maybe go back and see it uh, if you didn't freeze um, when you should have. Of course, print, uh, either you're gonna have a paper, it's gonna be stored in the computer and then you can download it on the pen drive, all depends what kind of system you have in your unit. And basically that is done for nobology. Uh, we went through the process of actually doing a, a scan in terms of uh, nobology. Um, I hope that helps you um, navigate through it. So the next thing, and I think we're almost there, uh, is the understanding about acoustic windows. Uh, you hear people talk about acoustic windows. Uh, so acoustic window, it uses organ or especially fluid to see uh, some deeper structure much better than without it. So it, it use a full bladder to see uterus, ovaries, and a nexa. We use the liver because the liver is full of blood. Uh, to see the gallbladder, right kidney, and pancreas. We scan between the ribs to get a window to see the liver and spleen. So ultrasound loves fluid and hates air. So gas, especially in the abdomen, uh, colon, 
transverse colon going on right on top of the pancreas, the stomach full of gas is the enemy of ultrasound. So that's why we ask the patient to be MPO. Uh, we ask the patient not to drink anything that has gas uh, to help us see better. So uh, this is just a, an example of a bladder that is empty. Here is the bladder. We can see part of the vagina coming in and the uterus over here. You might say, well, okay, I got the uterus, except the problem is that all this is gas. You can see a line of gas over here. This is all being covered by the intestines, which means I don't know if there is a pedunculated fibroid or if there's any other mass uh, that is being now obscured by the small intestine. For that reason, a full bladder where I can actually now use the uh, urine to delineate very well the uterus, vagina, cervix, endometrium, uh, and make sure that there's nothing hanging out from the fundus of the uterus. And of course, same thing on transverse. We can see the uterus very nicely, and we can see the adnexus uh, very nicely as well. So the bladder, I know that sometimes it's not uh, the situation you find yourself in, but uh, it is the ideal situation uh, for being able to diagnose properly, especially in the area of the fundus of the uterus. Uh, another uh, window, like I mentioned, this is a coronal CT scan, and we can see that if I put the probe between the two ribs, then I'm going to be able to see the liver and then I'm going to be able to see the kidney, right? So I am moving through here, boom, and this is actually what I'm looking at. So going between the ribs is a good way. I ask the patient to raise their arm in order to open up the vertebrates, uh, the, um, the, the ribs, sorry, and to be able to penetrate much better. So raising the arm, the ribs open up a little bit more, and I'm able to scan the whole liver, usually just by angling inside the rib. On transverse, uh, again, we are going to use the liver as our window. And in this case, we see the left lobe of the liver. We see the pancreas, SMA, splenic vein coming across, aorta, IVC. Uh, I know that uh, some people say, oh, you need to use uh, gel, gel, gel. Well, the gel, the idea of the gel is so that it would be between the probe and the patient and eliminate that air space. By putting the gel, you allow the sound wave to penetrate easily. But if you don't have uh, ultrasound gel, you can use KY jelly. We used to use mineral oil a long time ago when we started ultrasound. You could use hand cream, you could use uh, Vaseline, you can use cooking oil, you can use almost anything. The only thing you have to be careful with is that the, um, the rubber that is on top of the uh, ultrasound probe right here, the rubber, uh, if you use anything that could destroy or damage the rubber, uh, then of course it's not recommended. Um, but anything uh, liquid, uh, will uh, assist you in case you run out of gel or you don't have it where you have where you are. And I think uh, the last probe, I'm not going to go through all this, but it is, uh, as you know, we cannot autoclave. We cannot uh, put the probes in autoclave uh, to to um, uh, get rid of all the um, bacteria, we need to clean the probe as well as we can. Uh, there's a special products. There are wipes for the probe. We do not use anything that has Clorox as it will damage the probe. Um, so we cannot sterilize the probe, but we can disinfect the probe. For transvaginal and transrectal, there are special liquids that will take care of all any pathogens. Um, but of course, you never sterilize the probe because what happens, you're going to depolarize the crystal and you will not be able to produce sound. So I don't know if I went a little bit too fast, uh, but I wanted to give some time for questions. 
Um, and uh, so I think uh, we'll open up to questions. Uh, I don't know, Kai, about how you want to manage it or, but. Okay, so I'm not sure anybody wants to open up their microphone. I think I have yes. a question here. Okay, cooking oil. I have one that says cooking oil, question mark. I was taught that cooking oil destroys the face of the transducer. I do not I do not know a study that uses cassava to de develop a cooking agent. Um, I just said uh, in case of an emergency, you could use cooking oil. Um, I don't know which ones. I know that oils can damage plastic. That's why I mentioned you have to be very careful. But I wanted to for you to have the idea that we do not have to use um uh we do not have to use uh ultrasound gel exclusively anything that will glide and eliminate that cap uh that air pocket uh will be sufficient so can uh, inhibitants in alcohol be used to clean the probe we try to get away from alcohol as well uh, alcohol has shown that it will, uh, with time, damage that rubber uh, that protects the probe. So um, KY jelly is usually the one that is um, very easy to use. Mineral oil is the one we used to use when ultrasound started. And I started in ultrasound in 1979. I started doing ultrasound. And we used to have um, mineral oil. Uh, as our uh, uh, as our um, component that we used, it got all over the place. The patient were very happy because also their skin were very smooth and very nice. But it got all over the place, so we were happy when the gel came about. Okay, what would you suggest to use as a cleaning agent to clean the transducer after every patient? Uh, I don't know if you saw on the presentation they are. Um, usually there are a special pro, um, wipes that are made to disinfect. So any wipe that does not have chlorine or alcohol to disinfect is what we use here in the United States. Um, I'm not sure what else to use otherwise. What do you think of hydrogen peroxide as, as a cleaning agent between patients? Well, hydrogen peroxide is actually used uh, on a special unit 